Stealing focus. Greetings, Broadway babies. It's Emily here. Hey, what's up? It's Jeff. And we are starting a really new, exciting, fun project called Stealing Focus Interviews. Mm. Stealing Focus Interviews. And so where, what's it about exactly? Well, we are going to interview our friends and connections from the world of Broadway, the West End, LA theater, and beyond. Tours, what have you. Yes, all anything musical theater, we're gonna try to talk about it on this series. And so this is our first episode, and we have a really wonderful guest. Uh, Jeff, you wanna tell uh, I wanted to. Uh, we're very lucky today to have the musical director of a little Broadway show called Hades Town that you might have heard of. Music director, oh, yeah, vocal uh, arranger. He is not only the music director, he's also he also did the vocal arrangements. He plays piano. He plays the crap out of the piano. On the stage and interacts with, this is not a spoiler, he's interacting with some other yeah. actors. So he's wear, basically wearing four hats here. Yeah. Four hats. I don't know about you boys. <laughs> Everybody. But I welcome. find that very impressive. <laughs> It's very impressive. Uh, our first <laughs> guest on Stealing Focus Interviews, ladies and gentlemen, Liam Robinson. Liam Robinson! Liam Robinson on the keys! Liam Robinson on the keys! Liam Robinson on the keys! Hello, Liam. How are you? Good. Hello from New York City. Yes. Hello. I, I can see you're surrounded by pianos. Can we fit yeah. some more pianos in there? <laughs> <laughs> Staying in the edit. I forgot, I forgot I was connected to the to the device here. <laughs> skills. This guy's got skills. Uh, so Liam, uh, like we said, he is kind of the uh, gosh. You're kind of like the musical right hand man to Anais Mitchell, I would say, when it comes to Hades Town. Is that a correct assumption? Uh, that feels good. There's a few of them, but yeah, I'm certainly in the mix. Yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to start there. Uh, Anais Mitchell, where did you meet her? How did this connection happen? Um, so I've known Anais' music for a while and been a, been a fan of the album Hades Town. It's like a concept record from a bunch of years ago before the current theatrical life. And, um, but we met through the orchestrator Todd Sikafus, who's one of two orchestrators on the project. And uh, he had mixed a record that I was producing, um, actually a record of my, my sweetheart, Jean Rowe. And so we went out to Berkeley to mix that record with him because we had been a fan of his work on Aeneas' stuff and his work on, he's played in Ani DeFranco's band since way back and produced records for her and stuff. So we, um, we became buddies with Todd. And then like when Aeneas was looking for a music director and was trying different people out. Uh, Todd put my name in the mix. And that was the time of the off-Broadway run in 2016. That, uh, that's, that's where we started off, me and Aeneas uh, working together. And you've been pretty much there since that off-Broadway run. Like you've been in, gosh, you've been in every production, all two of them. I yeah, guess. so well, <laughs> off-Broadway, which, where was the off-Broadway production? So the off-Broadway run was in 2016 at New York Theater Workshop. And then the next year we had um, another sort of developmental production in Canada, in Edmonton, sort of off the beaten path. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, did you play, did you, have you performed there? I've been there, yeah. I, I was there on tour many years ago and it was the coldest I've ever been in my life. It was December, it was late December or mid to late December. Yeah. And you're in Vancouver and it's not too bad. Then you cross the Rockies and it's bone cold. It was the coldest I've ever yeah. been in my life. No. Yeah, no, I brought like a suitcase full of like clothes to get me through this, the different like degrees of fall. Right. But like by the second week, I was just wearing like all my clothes. Like it was, <laughs> and I'm from Wisconsin. So like I was, you know. You know cold. It was a, it was a new, I know cold. Yeah. yeah. So that was a short run in Edmonton. That was 2017, and then 2018 is when we went to London um, at the National Theater, and uh, that and that National Theater run was kind of ramped right up to Broadway. That was like when things started like moving steadily. The other stuff was like we were workshopping in between those productions, and AS was doing a lot of rewrites. But by the time we got to London, we were like kind of on the on the. So this, this show kind of started to solidify because that was going to be my question. I have I'm obsessed with uh, the the rehearsal process of shows, the development of shows. Um, obviously, 
when you guys were off Broadway, you were in the Village, and it's a relatively small theater, right? Like maybe 200 seats or something? Uh, yeah, like three, three something, yeah. Okay, it's relatively small compared to, you know. A Broadway house. Yeah, and even you guys are now in a, a, one of the smaller Broadway houses, but it's like perfect for the show, but we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. But when you were off Broadway, uh, it was, was it in the round? It was basically in the round with a little pie shaped piece that was the band that kind of completed the circle. But yeah, it was a very, it was, it was sort of a like amphitheater arena feel. I mean, still small, but. Yeah, I just watched a video the other day because I'm fascinated by the, the fact that um, Taserface was Hermes. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and he is uh, Chris Sullivan and yeah. I'm so obsessed with his voice, but I'm obsessed with Andre De Shields too. Like they're just so such completely different interpretations of that same character. But I just was watching that clip of him singing and I was like, oh shoot, they're in the round. Once upon a time it was a railroad line. Don't ask where, brother, don't ask when. Yeah, he's amazing. And he was in a, he was in a workshop before that that I, um, that I went and watched. Um, bef like a workshop I wasn't able to be a part of right before New York Theater Workshop. And I was just like totally blown away by Sully. His, yeah. he goes by Sully well, to, to his friends and he uh <laughs> and we 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 hit it off he's just like that dude's got charm to spare like he's and just talent like unreal oh man yeah, I mean he's off he's off in the he's 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 off your way now make oh good yeah come, come out to he's the with best us coast. in Cali <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah no he's in that he's in the what's what's the show what's the show oh he's on this is us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, that's like the biggest show in the world. He's on this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I've never yeah. seen it either. Yeah. Yeah. So he's <laughs> so he's bad. among the stars now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll, okay, we'll check that out. Taser face. <laughs> it's an old song. It's an old song. It's an old tale. So obviously, when a show uh, goes to different venues, you you you're like you had a unique perspective. Obviously, seeing this from the ground up. Like obviously when you go to a different space, we were just talking about the off-Broadway space compared to the Broadway space, you have to completely um, re-block. Even their design. looks were different. All the costumes were different. Well, like those lights in the Broadway show that do that swingy thing. Like you didn't have those in the off-Broadway space. We did. Um, I think there were just two of them. Ah. But that was that was like uh, Rachel Chavkin had that vision in her mind of, like from when she first heard that song, she just pictured that, that visual that carried through all productions. That's amazing. And and so was this the first time you'd ever met Rachel Chapkin? Um, you know, I had met her also through Jean Rowe, my sweetheart, uh, who'd been doing a theater project. It, it was a, a workshop of some sort out of town, like a residency, and I went up to visit her and met Rachel there. So our paths had crossed a little bit, but this this is the first time that we'd worked together was on Town. And now I, I just want to ask you, because Jeff has told me this story a few times. For those of you who don't know, uh, Liam is Jeff's cousin. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and Jeff, Jeff is Jeff always telling me, he, Jeff has told me this story many times, but I want to hear your take. You've never been like, I'm going to be a Broadway yeah. musician. Like that was never your goal. You were just a musician. And then you got into War Horse, right? Yeah, War Horse was my first um, professional theater gig. And I kind of thought maybe it would be my only one. It was, it happened very accidentally, or not accidentally, but it wasn't, it wasn't a thing I was seeking out, like you said. A friend forwarded me a casting uh, call, an email. They were, trying, they were trying to like broaden a search for a person who could sing, play accordion, or some kind of folky instrument who had familiarity with like British, Irish, um, Scottish folk music. And like it basically just described things that I could do. I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Like, I've never been to an audition. Like, what, I wonder what auditions are like. And so I went and they were like, they were really nice. And I, they just kept asking me to come back. And each time there'd be more British people in the room and they'd all be like, oh, brilliant, brilliant. And I was like, I would just came away every time. I was like, man, I feel great. These people just like keep telling me I'm brilliant. And then they were like, we're going to offer you a job. And I was like, I don't even know what this job is. Like, yeah. so the casting director, bless his heart, Daniel Sui, like had long conversation with me on the phone describing what like theater work is. And he was like, there's eight shows a week. I'm like, eight shows. How is that even possible? Yeah, yeah. So, well, and Jeff always tells me how like you came up to him and you were, you were like. Me. No, he called me. So, okay, I, so I, was, I was out here in LA and I get a call from Liam. We talked every now and then. And he's like, hey, I got a question for you. I've been offered this job and I don't know if I want to take it. 
because I got to join the union. I got to join the <laughs> equity. And I'm like, well, what's the job? He's like, oh, it's called War Horse at Lincoln Center. And I'm like, take the job. <laughs> the job War Horse at Lincoln, at Lincoln Center. Center. And I'm just, oh, I'm overwhelmed at this point. I had heard of it because obviously, yeah, you just mentioned all the creative, uh, or the British, it's, it started in the West End. So yeah. was there any crossover with cast coming to New York or was it a full new cast? A whole new cast, mm. but just uh, the creative team was massive because there's all these puppets and they had puppetry coordinators and movement people and the people that built the puppets even came and like so there's this huge british creative team that that arrived with the show and i got to see you in that show and you were fantastic you you went on for the lead twice a week right and then you were on the ensemble the rest of the time song man we uh we had like a kind of musical duo um where i would play you know sort of sec the second part and uh six shows a week and then go on for the lead yeah so I was blown away when I saw the puppeteering. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. Like you, you were just talking about the people who designed it were there. Obviously it was an intensely cool theater situation. And I've, yeah. never, seen, I've never seen the Spielberg movie, but I think it's completely different. They used real horses, they, they went for realism, obviously. But for, for the people that were lucky enough to see your show at Lincoln Center, I mean, y'all know who you are. Well, and so, uh, <laughs> was that a straight line from War Horse to Town, or you've been doing other stuff in between? War Horse yeah, no, I, I mean, my, my life is, has primarily been as a, as a touring musician, playing in bands, being a songwriter, working on records, just really in the music world, in the folky world, songwriting, pop stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I did War Horse for a year, I was, you know, that was intense for me to like sign up for a whole year. It ran for another, but that was, I took my exit. Yeah. And yeah. Just like you went were... on the road and was, I did a lot, a ton of traveling between War Horse. That was, what was that, 2011? Yeah. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. And so, yeah, I mean, the, I think the War Horse credit played into, you know, people maybe giving, trusting me with, somehow trusting me to music direct the off-Broadway show which I had like no resume to to do but you know knew at least the theater the process somewhat from the inside um but no not a straight line at all I I, I didn't figure I would be back in in professional theater stuff until until the Hades Town thing came along that's amazing and, and when we so Emily and I were in New York last March the month that you guys opened on Broadway yeah, we got to see the final dress rehearsal of Hades Town. Yeah, we got to so hook up. <laughs> it was crazy because um, our friend Matt Murphy was taking photos with Joan Marcus. So both of them were in the pit taking photos during the run. And then we were up in the first row of the Mez, and there were no souvenirs, no programs, no alcohol, nothing. It was just like, here's a really friendly group of friends and here's the last rehearsal y'all are gonna get. And we saw it and it, I mean, it blew our minds. It was amazing. I couldn't even believe it. It's such a, it feels like such an intimate space, but it's a, it's a big old Broadway house. Um, I had to imagine that was a big, um, I guess, draw for getting the show in there. Which theater is it? It's in the Walter Kerr. The Walter Kerr, that's right. So See, I would, I would have checked was... my program, but I don't have a program. Yeah, the, the <laughs> last thing that was in there before us was Bruce Springsteen's One Man Show. Oh God, that's right. Oh, yeah. So that it's would got be some good juju. For that too. <laughs> yeah. Did you, well, I don't know if this is a, we might cut this out because this is kind of a spoiler, but when you first saw the set move like that, that where that ceiling just keeps going up and up and up and up, did that blow your mind? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah totally. yeah that happened for the first time in the london set the london set was the first one that the dna and the skeleton of of the production in london is was where we kind of like okay we hit it this is the right thing amazing um so that was the first time the set moved and yeah it was i mean it was actually there's a there's a moment in there's tons <laughs> of fog and anyone who does theater knows that like fog it's like completely like dependent on the atmosphere of the room. And so in, in the National Theater, um, in the Olivier space, big space, you know, pack a thousand people in there, atmosphere suddenly changes. Wow. There was a, wow. let's just say there was like an invisible scene, basically. Yeah. It was just, hit, it was just hidden behind fog. So the fog went into the house <laughs> and nobody could see anything? 
<laughs> yeah, nobody could see. It. I mean, we were just luckily that we had a, a number of previews to go so that, but it, we, it was just like we all. It was the fun. <laughs> just a, this beautifully designed scene that no one could, oh. no one could see. <laughs> and that was the first time that uh, Andre De Shields was in the show in London. Uh, yeah, he'd been he'd done some workshops prior to that, but that was first production. What was it like when you guys got him? Was it like you got to shields? Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> Nothing more to be said, right? Nothing more to be said. He's. I feel like he's playing himself in so many ways. I don't know. You know, just looking at Andre to shields over the years and just his fabulous outfits and just his whole style. I was just watching him going like, man, this is the part he was born to play because yeah. he's just like playing himself. But. I love him. Well, and we, and we mentioned uh, how last March we were able to see you guys right before you opened. And we also saw Oklahoma in town at the Circle on the Square. And you guys had some crossover <laughs> with actors. Your Orpheus was, Dan or your Damon, Orpheus before Reeve. Yeah, Damon mm -hmm. Dono. Yep. And Nathan Kosey was, he was your, uh, what was he your? Was He'd been the associate music director uh, for some workshops and a production in Canada. And I, w I mean, we, we I, I was, you know, thinking that he was going to come on Broadway with us, but just luck, things were in the cards, which was awesome. It was so cool that that show went up at the same time. It was Amber really Gray. cool seeing them back, kind of back to back, because, you know, I know Oklahoma very well, um, but it was obviously a, a totally different version. And it was cool going from Hadestown to Oklahoma and seeing these really small, folky um, orchestras or combos, really. Mm -hmm. um, and just the bleed over from that. I really like that Broadway is kind of, there's a lot of that right now. There's a lot of like folky infusion happening in a lot of shows, or at least there was before, you know, the world stopped turning. <laughs> <laughs> well, but also, that's what I wanted to ask you too, because uh, it's, so, again, like watching Oklahoma was amazing because the music was so authentic and I had just never seen Oklahoma done that way like the folky bluegrassy type style, the music that you play, it just seems to be taking over and I love it because it works so well for the media. For musicals, it works great. And I think, I, I'm just so happy for you that you were just, got you right in the mix at the right time. Uh, when you first heard Patrick Page's low notes, what was your, what was your thought process? And did you know, did you, were you involved in casting him? No, he, uh, Amber and Patrick, are the they 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 came before me both of them have been in in every every production that i've been a part of and they were just they're just baked in at this point <laughs> watching amber gray was like watching if bernadette peters and eartha <laughs> kit had a baby and she was made of like pure fire and gravel yeah i, love she would, her. I think i think she would she would appreciate that okay, okay. <laughs> just tell her that for me <laughs> Um, so what were the uh, what were the Tony Awards like for Hades Town? The last Tony Awards we've ever had. <laughs> oh yeah, we're still the reigning uh, we're still yeah, the still reigning champs. champions. We st we still have the belt. Uh, <laughs> they were crazy. They're really wild. Uh, let's see, what were the Is Tony your Awards? First Tony? <laughs> uh, well, it was first time that I was at the Tonys for War Horse, which also kind of like swept the awards. We I didn't get to go to the they just sent the horse. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they sent pups and puppeteers and the horse. And because uh, that's that's the show. I mean, that was the show. Like Jeff said, it's like the puppet the puppetry is what I mean, they sent that horse to like Yankee Stadium and stuff. Like <laughs> like that horse made the rounds. And he, um, he hit two home runs that horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He threw the first pitch. <laughs> um Yeah, the Tonys are crazy. Uh it's like they I mean, it's all, it's part of what's kind of amazing about the Broadway in particular is just like, it's so Manhattan centric. Like you're just, you know, Radio City's like spitting distance from the theater and like actually pretty hilariously, they want to, you use your own theater as your like dressing room for the Tonys. So they're like busing you, you, you sort of at your theater, they bus you to Radio City and like the bus takes longer than just walking there. But it's just this whole, it's just a whole like midtown it just so feels like so like just such a new york industry 
I never even, I mean, as a kid, I didn't even know the Tonys were on TV. Like until I was in Warhorse, I was like, you can watch the Tonys like on, t- on like someone in like Wisconsin can watch the Tonys. <laughs> so, on CBS? Yeah. Now I know. Yeah. <laughs> but they're fun. I got a, a just a, a friend of Aeneas has had an extra ticket. So I kind of bounced around. Like I, I got to watch the hour before the televised awards, which is awesome because it's like the, you know, designers and like all the, I mean, well, people like that I, awards. yeah, and people that I had worked with for years and just like people that I had like a, so much love for, get get to see them, like get those, get that recognition was really special. So I got to sit in my seat for that. And then I kind of split towards the beginning of the show to go perform and then ran back to my seat and got bussed to the theater. It was a wild night. Yeah, it was crazy. I was I was very happy. The, the aforementioned lights swinging was in the Tony performance. I was very happy they brought the lights over. It's insane that they that that production happens. Like they, all this like set stuff. I mean, they there's I've more crew than I've ever seen in my life because they have to just get these like entire sets on and off Radio City. Like you know, it's like a talent show, but that costs like a billion dollars or something. Um, So, but yeah, I mean, the coolest stuff was like, like definitely for people who haven't seen it, like check out Andre's shield speech. That's like, I mean, that's like momentous. Oh my God. Rachel's speech was super moving and Aeneas. I mean, but Andre shields is like, he's a prince and he he just getting his moment, which is beautiful. Oh my God! It was. Yeah, it was he was he was really ready too. I think he, he had a whole prepared thing. Oh my God! So, that he's always ready. That dude's yeah. always ready. <laughs> well, I, well, Emily talked about how his style. His style is amazing. But I was so proud of you. Like when you guys were in London and there was some press op or photo op, and you're in pictures with him. But you're styling too, bro. You got the hat on. You got like your hat and bow tie. <laughs> I mean, when you can sit, when you can get be in a picture next to Andre DeShields and hold your own with style, I mean, come on, you're doing something. <laughs> well, the difference is the most stylish man like ever. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about the recording, the Broadway, the original Broadway cast recording. I know that that's insane too, that whole process. What's the schedule like for the musicians? Oh, it's unreal. Like, I've never been a part of something like that. Sunday matinee, you get done with the show grab all the music off the stands, whatever like few pieces of equipment you need from the theater. And like, well, actually, I mean, we were at the, we were at the studio that morning to start setting up all day. Mm. But yeah, after the matinee, the band goes to the studio start and does like a session in the evening. And then just the next day is like full on. I mean, what, what a 12 hour session, maybe that's, no, probably 14. And then the next, and then it's Monday and then Tuesday, basically there until mid afternoon and then go and start the next week shows. Wow. Yeah, no, I was like, I mean, and this show, like we decided to do it the way some kind of through composed, through sung shows do where it's like, we just recorded the entire thing. Like it wasn't selections. Yeah it's a double album and so it's just like a crazy amount of music because the whole show you know say the show is like two hours and ten minutes it's like maybe there's two hours of music like oh, you cut yeah, out the applause like and that's <laughs> yeah i mean so I'm to aware. do that in two days was like you know you basically play, think about what you want to do different play another take and then you're got to move on next song <laughs> I'm used to making records where you're just like, oh, let's work on the sound of the bass drum. Yeah, we're taking our time with this recording. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Everyone will tell you, Broadway cast recordings are always insane because it always is that same setup. They made a whole documentary about it with company. (laughs) You may have heard of it. You may have heard of it. But anyway, yeah, but but a song, a show like this, uh, I think is, is really cool that you guys did it sort of sung through without it being selections. I mean, that that's the perfect choice but it's also one of those shows where like the ensemble and the band are very much interacting with the cast a lot so not only is it just you guys playing on the album but you know it's ensemble and being like like cheering and stomping and because then you know it kind of loses something if you don't have that yeah so i imagine it was a lot of work Um, yeah the most of the most of the session is was all in one 
room maybe you know drums and trombone are isolated but basically it's the entire band and the entire cast including all the chorus and swings was like most of the recording session was just everybody in front of them their own microphone like it there it, it most of it didn't make sense to divide up you know of course like some solos but there's so much so many numbers that involve everyone um i was just uh you know watching some youtube clips and the um hades town uh npr tiny desk concert popped up and you're like the star of that dude like really <laughs> No, you Andre are, is definitely the star. Time you get these amazing <laughs> close-ups on you, like playing the piano, and mm. I mean, and then you play the accordion. Do you, I don't remember. Do you play the accordion in the show? Uh, in way down Hades Town, yeah. I, the piano, the accordions, maybe on about a quarter of the songs in the show. Because I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember either. I I remember you on that piano a lot, but you know, so much of it washes over. And you guys have such an amazing band. It's oh, yeah. just. Phenomenal, and I love that you, that you get a shout out at the top of Act Two. There aren't many, there aren't many Broadway shows that do that because yeah. how are you gonna how are you gonna shout out every person in the pit? <laughs> well, it's just awesome that your name, your character in, in the show. She said your name in the show. Liam Robinson on the key. Is this on the Broadway cast recording. Like nobody, how does, when does that happen on a Broadway cast recording? It's pretty rare. I mean, they didn't even Passing Strange, they didn't do that. Passing they Strange, that in, they do it at the end. In the, in the recording? Uh, well, yeah. they do it in the Broadway show, but yeah, that's the only other time I've kind of heard that Very on a Broadway similar, recording. Yeah, obviously similar situation with the band interacting. The, Passing Strange, I love the show. It was the best synthesis I'd ever seen of story. Until Hades Town. Until Hades Which Town. is what we're talking about. Um. <laughs> how does the wall keep us free? My children, my children, how does the wall keep us free? And our work is never done. My children, my children, and the war is never won. The enemy is poverty, and the wall keeps out the enemy. So Why We Build the Wall is obviously an incredibly powerful song. When I saw the show, I had heard it, but I was blown away by it. It's such an interesting song structurally. Is, is, did you, how did that song develop? Was that always there or was that changing too over the course of all the changes? That song, no, that, that song was sort of monolithic, like it, it didn't change. And from hearing Aeneas talk about it, it also like, she wrote it like very quickly, like it just sort of came to her all of a piece, which is not generally true of her writing. She's very like, meticulous and sort of, um, you know, just line by line, she works her way through a song, but I think that one just kind of dropped and that was done. So yeah. that's been there all along. I love the, uh, it's almost like the child song element of adding on a, a piece of the song and then you all have to sing it as you add that piece onto it. It's yeah. just, you're building the wall. It's amazing. Yeah, it's so well, cool. I, I love that that's how the, that's how the song came about because that is, some of the best songs, they just, they just come out and that's it, they're done. You can't change them, they're done, you know? So it's pretty cool that uh, she had that kind of moment, you know, that sort of inspiration. Yeah, um, and that song is, I mean, that song is over 10 years old at this point. What happened when Anais Mitchell asked you to uh, do the vocal arrangements? Were you nervous? Uh, it, come, it sort of happened um, in this sort of organic process. Like there were things that needed some arranging off Broadway. Um, and so it was a, it was kind of a trial run, like, there were just some new material that needed to be arranged for the fates or, you know, for the ensemble. And, and that just kept growing, like with every, with every workshop, it just became clear each time that I was the vocal arranger. I was like, okay, actually my, you know, sort of imprint is on more and more of the music. And also the cast expanded. And they had always had it in her mind that there would be this worker chorus especially once we go underground in Hades Town, that there's the workers of Hades Town are, the, are a chorus, like a Greek chorus that has a voice. Off Broadway, there wasn't the budget for that size of cast. But once we moved uh, to Canada, it was like, and to London, the cap, cast kept growing. And so arranging just had to be done for all those voices. And Aeneas was always hearing lots of group singing and lots of harmonized singing. So I think it has, I mean, it, I think it has more like sort of divided singing than a lot of shows like there's just in a folky kind of way and it makes sense for her music that it's just a lot of group singing 
like there'll be songs that maybe are still mostly a solo, but then everyone joins in and not just for like a unison line, but for like a four part division or six part division. Yeah, that happens. Um, I, mean, I, I was just gonna say like the ensemble is one of my, the chorus is one of my favorite parts of the show. I loved watching them. I know everyone's obsessed with the tall guy, the really tall oh, yeah. guy with the arms. Oh man. <laughs> He's got arms. Oh man, that guy, everyone's obsessed with him. Um, <laughs> but like, but, but that guy aside, like they are such a fun ensemble and, and you're right. It's like, um, all those little, like, it's like backup singers, um, yeah. coming in on certain lines that Eurydice and Orpheus sing. And, um, it's very different than, um, a normal Broadway musical where it's like, and then the chorus comes in and we all sing the chorus. It, it, it's really fascinating. It adds to that kind of otherworldly element to the show. Well, yeah. And getting back, I didn't finish quite the thought on Nathan Kosey. He was your associate music director. And then he ended up leaving the show to direct Oklahoma at Circle in the Square, musically direct. Um, so that's where I was going with this whole sort of uh, bluegrass folky takeover of Broadway, and and you had you had mentioned that those connections, and they were they were there at the Tonys that day too. That night, you know, they've been going through the same stuff as you. So there's been this really strange connection. Do you guys just hang out and trade stories? Me and Nathan, yeah. So I'm sitting in my music studio right here, and Nathan's studio is across the hall. So <laughs> we're we're good pals. <laughs> so he might peek his head through that door at any moment. <laughs> I know he's. He, I know he. Uh, he went. He went out of town to. He is. He's escaping New York for the week. So. But yeah, no. Nathan. Nathan was a part of the development of Oklahoma of that production of Oklahoma for years. So, hmm. I nabbed him to do some work on Hades Town, but he his his you know stake was in the ground with music directing Oklahoma. So. I was very you guys, happy for you guys that. have taken over. You've absolutely taken over Broadway. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, do you have a song in Hades Town that you like really love or you look forward to playing every night? You're like, this is the part I love. Hmm. Good question. I mean, I feel like there's different songs that mean different, that speak to different parts of me. Like there's especially a couple duets like Halo Songbird or How Long, like to my like songwriter brain, like, and those songs have been pretty much untouched since I first heard them on the concept record. They, they, they were, they were done. And as so my songwriter, the part of me that's, that's like really into just the perfectly crafted song, like those are songs I get excited about. And then as a player playing, you know, some of the orchestrators, great piano parts like I get very excited about those like song doubt comes in has just like a very like oh. just like meaty nice piano part that is like I look forward to playing that's when Orpheus and Eurydice are making their journey to oh it's so to above ground I love that song with the face yeah. oh my god um, and it has some sort of kind of orchestral kind of feel to it it's very like expansive orchestration yeah. it's fun it's fun to play my my favorite song you have a you have a big old solo in is um when the chips are down because oh, i yeah. love the fates i love them they're my favorite character probably um and their harmonies are just my favorite thing and you get that really cool little piano solo in the middle of it it's just so good every time i'm like oh, Liam. <laughs> yeah, there's, I mean, the fact that there's improvisation in the show, I think, well, it's just, it's it's helpful for the musicians, even if it's small moments, to just have a bit where you get to, like, you can change it every night. It's glorious. Because part of the challenge of theater is just that you're doing the same show every night, and so you have that's to find fresh. those moments. But that's, yeah. another, but that's another departure from the traditional pit in Broadway shows. There's no improvising going on. You know, typically that's just not done. You stick to the orchestrations. <laughs> I want to know if there were any like um, really memorable like mess ups or flubs either from you or anyone else Ooh. you want to talk about during a show? Oh yeah. I mean the first, uh, maybe the first preview, I think it was, I, I defeat Andrea Line. It was really, it was, it was amazing. I don't think you would. I don't think you would mind me saying. Like it was, oh. there was just a long stretch of music going by, and Andre. He's just, just kind of. He's just chilling. 
And I just, you know, people, I just yelled the line across the stage. Just had, just had to be done. You're like, Orpheus is a poor boy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the line. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I Liam Robinson. Liam Robinson. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Um, he was, I mean, he, yeah, Andre, Andre's, Andre's not going to walk off the stage and be embarrassed, though. He's just like, that's just what happened. Yeah. He's, oh, yeah. he's so authentic. He's just, he's just in the moment, man. I love that. Yeah. If, all, if we could all be like that. Um, I, I was going to ask you quickly about the tour. Uh, I know that obviously the tour is probably postponed at this point. Did you guys finish with casting before all this went down or was it still in the works? No, we were right in the middle of it. Yeah. We were actually like literally in the middle of it. Um, the, the day of the shutdown, we were, we were in, in tour casting. Yeah, I mean, it's, obviously it's going to have a life and it's, uh, you know, fingers crossed the world returns in some ways to the way it was. And it's really exciting because we were going to get it out here in, 20, in 2022. Well, and what I appreciate about Town is that you, I remember watching it and going, oh, you could do this show anywhere. Like, it's going to have a really great, I think, regional theater, community theater. It could work in a black box. It could work outside. It could, there could be a junior version. It, there could, yeah. seriously, like it's a very adaptable show that I think will have a really strong post-Broadway life. Um, Are there nights when you're like, here we go again, I gotta do it, or is it just a joy? Oh yeah, no, there's definitely the challenge. The repetition is the challenge. Um, I mean, I will say as a, as a musician in the show, the musicians get a completely different contract than the actors like we're allowed to choose to not be there which is yeah i mean it's amazing like we you know i have my associate and he plays several shows a week and you know so that is allows the musicians to go play other gigs even if it's not a gig that pays as well they just like wanna it's to it helps people Makes just to keep the keep it fresh and you're excited then to come back yeah. But yeah, no, definitely being one of the arrangers in the show has has kept me with it, kept me, kept me engaged. So the fact that I have a sort of like a stake in the in the creativity of the show, um, and then just seeing it through different processes, you know, like through like it'll be interesting to see it through that getting launching it on the tour or you know other future productions. I think that that part is certainly my favorite, the making of it. See, you're, you're, you're getting that creative team bug. Like, we'll get, we'll now get, you're just going to start making musicals say, and writing we'll, we'll, musical that's scores. That's what I was going to ask, because here's a follow-up question. Obviously, Jean Rowe, uh, you, you're in her you guys are in a band together. You write, you chat, you travel um, and perform. Are you guys thinking about writing any concept records? or? Oh, there's, you know, the back burner, the back burner musical that uh, plenty of people have. <laughs> <laughs> back burner the musical. Yeah, yeah. back burner the musical. It's not, uh, it's not. It's not cooked enough to. It's not cooked enough for, to for daylight. But yeah, it's there. Yeah, but in quarantine, it's a great time for drafts. <laughs> yeah, certainly. <laughs> but um, I mean, Jean has 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 a a kind of a, a theater project that she's had a few um, performances of workshops and. But you know, m mostly, in my life outside the theater, I'm writing songs. You know, and they're four minutes long, and that's. And that and that's it. That's the yeah. container. You just try and make that container really tight. Let, can we go back a little bit to when you knew that you wanted to make a career of this? Because you you went to school in New York, right? Yeah, I went to a state school in Wisconsin for a couple of years. You know, and I was figuring out what it was in music that I was most interested in, and it was a great school. It was mostly people there to study, to be educators, to be choir directors and band directors, and that sort of thing. And yeah, I was on a very like creative path and discovering that I, writing was kind of my main passion. So I moved to New York after a couple of years of college and I bounced around. I met a lot of great musicians when I went to the new school for a year. Many of the bands that I play in are still connections from there, but I ended up at the Manhattan School of Music studying classical composition was sort of where I figured out that's what I wanted my academic path to be. So I ran a contemporary music ensemble for a few years and was doing more writing in the concert world. And I now I feel like just over time, my different interests have started to kind of meld interests in, I'm interested in collaboration, which is like one of the big parts of theater that's, that's so fun, just collaborating with people, different expertise, my interest in songwriting, my interest in orchestration that comes from the classical side. So gradually like finding how those things can fit together. 
Manhattan School of Music is uptown, right? Upper 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 West. Yeah, it's up by Columbia University. Okay, yeah, I remember because I visited you at least a couple times up there. I forgot that it was classical. I was thinking you were always more jazz focused. I I was before that, and I was studying jazz composition. But I think I just I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to get out of school, and I I saw that in the classical conservatory there were just these hard skills that I was really after orchestration and counterpoint and stuff and i had i don't consider myself a jazz musician but kind of every musician i play with is and that's sort of the approach that i that my brain takes like you know i approach music kind of as a jazz musician like try and understand it quickly and just be able to play in it um i'm not you know i'm definitely not a classical pianist i'm a i'm a i'm an improviser yeah, that's yeah. that's where my heart is. So, so what what do we think is the uh, plan for Hades Town since we're under lockdown till? I mean, Broadway is not coming back till next year. I saw <laughs> uh, next year, or uh, I don't know, the year after, or yeah. that. I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, it's the holding pattern <laughs> I mean, right now. Yeah, it's the holding pattern. I mean, people think people hope that things come back to where they were. There'll probably be some intermediate steps. Yeah, hopefully that tour will go out. Hopefully there'll be some, you know, international productions. Who knows? What was the, wasn't there a time when you guys had a blackout at the theater and you sang outside? Yeah, it was a small blackout. It blacked out like a sort of west side of Manhattan, but it would happen to sort of 45 minutes before a show. Uh, and yeah, I don't know, it's a very novel event. We were all just kind of waiting around, waiting for the official word that the show had been canceled. And so we were hanging on the street with the fans. And, Somebody whipped out a trombone and started singing and away we went. That was one of the coolest videos ever associated with Broadway. Cool, yeah. It was just like you guys were outside doing your thing and the crowd was just all around you. It was, it was, it was pretty great. Yeah, people saw that in like, I feel like somebody saw it in like Singapore or something. Yeah. Like I was, like it somehow must have been. A, you know, there was nothing like, uh, there was no like major news that day, I guess. So that was like. <laughs> <laughs> if, only, if only we could go back to those days. I know. Oh, oh, blacked out for 45 minutes. No big deal. Yeah, this video went viral. Isn't it cool? <laughs> yeah. When, when was the moment when you were like, oh shit, this is really good. This is like, gonna, this is going to be a phenomenon. This is going to crush. That concept record, you know, the show had a long life before I got involved as a, piece of some sort theater or just music and that I mean that record was like that really like changed things in my brain that just really opened stuff up did That's you awesome. um <clears throat> it's really cool because it's unique in the sense that you have a, a lady who wrote it and a lady director and as crazy as it sounds that doesn't happen very often did that um I don't know was that uh, something that was having two gals in charge? Did that change the energy of the show at all? Or did that affect the vibe? I'm sure it did. Like, I don't, um, you know, I don't have comparison to other, to being a part of another musical uh, developing. But I mean, Rachel Chavkin is just like one of the smartest people, like men or women. Like, she's just, she's, she's just excellent at her job. It definitely, change the energy it also has like a really smart lead producer who's a woman yeah and um so yeah i mean i think it just it also kind of gave people a lot of love for it too i think was like you know people believed in in its you know what it was also like representing yeah rachel chavkin also did the great comet right um yep yeah, and that show has a very similar vibe to Hades Town in mm. some ways. Definitely mm. driving on the accordion stuff and the like. You know, Accor the accordions are taking over. Accordions. They're taking over the world. <laughs> no. Liam will be our, our great leader at some point. Weird Al's moment has come. <laughs> <laughs> that's the next musical, a Weird Al musical. You can collaborate. Oh, wow. That's probably already being developed. Okay, so Liam, we have five questions that we're, we're going to ask everyone at the end of the show. And uh, you have to answer. You don't have to think about it too much. Um, and uh, you know, you're a music music director, musician. So just think of the equivalent for your life. So here's your first question: What's your favorite musical? Um, 
favorite thing that I've seen that's like contemporary was probably the band's visit. But the best musical is obviously West Side Story. That's that's is that a trick question? That's definitely not the best at all. Musical. Not at all. That's okay. I got the Leonard right Bernstein answer. score. Musicians <laughs> love Leonard Bernstein. Another Spielberg movie. He took War Horse, and now he took uh, West Side Story coming out. That's true. Yeah. Now he he came and visited the show. He was it was really fun when he came backstage. He signed the set and was rapping with our director for a while. So Say again. At War Horse, you mean, right? At no, at Hades Town. Oh, ooh, yeah, yeah. you guys must have some fun celebs who come. See Wait, it. so Spielberg came and signed the set at Hades Town? Yeah. You guys are fun. <laughs> you guys you are fun. You're just hanging out. Okay. Okay. All right. What is your dream project or show or role? Um, I would love to like build uh just weird giant musical sculptures that you know like the can like sort of like music boxes. You know, maybe when I'm like an old, crazy, retired person, I'll just build like a sculpture park of like giant, you know, Big like cal calliopes. Yeah, like hurdy gurdy. Yeah. Okay, question three. What project or show or whatever are you most proud of? So my sweetheart, Jean Rowe, who I've mentioned in the interview, is uh, also a songwriter and collaborator. And we, in, I think that was 2012, 13, she's, she wrote this really amazing new national anthem for the United States. It's called Arise, Arise. And uh, we got everyone together in a big room to play it. I wrote a brass arrangement, there was a choir. And once we got everyone together in a room to record it, we were like, well, we should film it. And so like, just the production of that, making this one song into a really cool, special video document and recording was like, that was definitely like, you know, a peak moment. And it's still there. And that song has had a life of its own. People keep, always, choirs ask to sing it. And so that's, oh gosh. that's the thing gonna, that's still out there. I, ha I have to, hold on a mental note, because I have to, I have to do inspirational songs with choirs all the time. Arise, arise. Okay. You know, you're the, you're our first guest, but I guarantee nobody else's answer will be as good as that one. I know. <laughs> okay, so number four, and we're putting this in a nice way. What musical hurts your soul? <laughs> Uh, and why is it written so, by but probably like something like Cats or something. I mean, yeah. Cats <laughs> That's is just a great too... answer. Great answer. There's <laughs> nothing it's, wrong with this. Yes, Cats. Is that a good answer? Yeah, it's cats the opposite is a great of what answer. you guys are doing. Okay, finally, who is your musical or musical theater uh, hero or avatar? Who do you want to be? Who's your inspiration? Oh, it's, it's Andre. It's Andre de Shields. Is that a trick question too? I mean, nope. come on. Nope. <laughs> nope. There's. Andre de Shields should be everyone's inspiration. <laughs> Come on. And like you've been able to hang out with him for quite a while now. Do you guys get together and go bowling or? Does <laughs> 83 year old Andre de Shields go bowling? Um, I've, I'm, I've music directed his, he's done this show now a couple times outside of Hades Town, but during the time it's called Old Dog New Tricks. And so he um, has developed this, it's a music show but also him telling stories of his life. And we got oh, to do like that. It's like a cabaret, and like a one man show. It's okay. like a cabaret. Yeah, he has a couple backup singers in a band and like, um, so we did that um, at Lincoln Center and in Florida and stuff. Yeah, so Andre and I, Andre and I put some miles in together. He's a, we have great love, so. <laughs> That's very exciting. I, I'd, I'd love to at some point see that show. Old dog in your you know, it might, I don't know if it's, so it's part of the um, Lincoln Center's American Songbook series. And they did film it for some kind of streaming. I don't know if they released it yet or if that's down the road, but it might yeah. be out, there might be something out there on the web. Very cool. cool. But yeah, Andre's the Andre's Andre's the shit. And with I don't that, know, maybe you have to edit that. With, no, with, with <laughs> Andre is the shit, we are going to say goodbye to Liam, the music director, vocal arranger of Hades Town. Pianist, and he also you know, cheers and hangs out so, with the cast. Thank you so much, Liam. You were wonderful. Enjoy the Midwest and getting out of New York for a while. And I hope we get to see you soon. Thank you so much, Liam, for joining us, man. I can't wait to hang out with you in person next time. In real life. Well, good to see you in, in, in virtual life. Yeah. Liam Robinson on the key.
Big Five.